Good morning, everyone. So wonderful to be part of a family like this, Church of the Nations, and um, I really just, it's, it feels like we're going to have a family chat this morning, and that's really my heart this morning, and I just want to thank the AC for laying a foundation for, for sons like us in the house that come, can come into our purpose, we can come into our destiny, and most importantly, we can feel loved and we can feel safe. And uh, just the, the values and the boundaries uh, which you've created for all of us to grow up in, in a certain sense, are not restricting in any way, they're liberating, uh, because it brings such safety for us in this world that's so dear Amen. And uh, so we just, I just thank you guys, the AC, for all the input and laying the foundations for us, and especially to Lou and Edna, for all your love and mentoring and discipleship and leadership and everything that you've poured into us in the last 18 years. We really love you guys. And uh, Jock's also here, Jock van Heerden, he's had a big impact in my life, and I just thank him for all his wisdom and management, amen. Great, so this morning, I've titled the sermon this, <clears throat> Who is in your house? Who is in your house? And uh, I'm excited f- for this morning, I really believe this, and I'm gonna, this morning I'm also going to be speaking to you today about maturing in your sonship, maturing in your sonship, and uh, we're going to look at that this morning, and uh, let's just pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just thank you for your great love for us. I thank you, Father, that you are faithful, and I thank you for your sons and daughters sitting here this morning, that you truly are going to shift every single one of us. Father God, that we can behold you, that we can become more like you, and that we can fulfill every purpose that you have for us and that no one in this room will be robbed of what you're going to do in their lives. We trust you for that. I pray, Father God, for a, a replacing and a placing of sons in this house, Father God, to fulfill every purpose and every destiny. And we thank you, Father, that you do it by your grace and by your anointing because you love us so much. We honor you. We pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation as we unpackage your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm really trusting this morning that God's going to shift our hearts in the area of sonship and maturing into sonship. And my key scriptures are, we're going to be looking at is in Galatians 4. We're going to be looking at Galatians 4, 1 to 7. Then we're going to be looking at Galatians 4, 21 to 31 as our key scriptures this morning. Amen. So you can turn there with me or it will be on the screens. A little bit of background. Paul's obviously writing to the Galatians. And um, the church in Galatia is going through some challenges uh, because it's a bit of a mixed church. There's some Jews and Greeks in the church. And um, Paul's hearing through the grapevine that there's uh, Judeas that are coming in and trying to speak to the new Greek and and, uh, Jewish converts to get them to come back under the law and uh, to try and remember that they need to be circumcised. If they really want to be holy, they need to be circumcised and they need to do certain things, certain things that they have to do to, if they really want to mature in their faith. And obviously the Galatian church is very excited. They want to mature in their sonship and they're ready for this thing. And now they're beginning to get a bit confused. And uh, Paul's coming in and he's addressing in Galatians 4 uh, the confusion that is coming in their mag, uh, into their midst regarding the authentic gospel of Jesus Christ and his grace. And he's coming to bring clarity for that to move them into maturity, into their sonship. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. So let's look at Galatians 4, 1 to 7. It says this, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. To redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Amen? It's key. Redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption. Can we say that together? Redeem so we might be adopted. Amen. Then it says here, and because you are sons, 
God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Then, so he's using this illustration for the Greeks because they would understand uh, what he was talking about because in their culture they had uh, that word adoption, which would mean the placing of a son. So he was using this illustration here to help them unpackage what is going on am amongst them. Then he moves on and he's going to give the Jews a bit of an example um, so that they can understand in their context and in their culture what is he talking about. So he says a bit further in Galatians, he says in uh, 4.21 to 24, for the Jews to understand, he says, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what he, the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. These things are to be taken figuratively, or it's an allegory. The woman represents two covenants. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Then I'm going to carry on from verse 28. It says, Now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At the time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance of the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Wow. So we're going to unpackage that today and look at that. And I want to say God is absolutely amazing because... I'm standing here today having been a son in this house uh, um, 18 years and sitting under the teaching of sonship and I feel like I'm only getting it now. <laughs> and, and, and God said to me, that's okay. There's grace for that. If you're only getting the revelation now and it took you 18 years, that's not a problem with me. He, he's patient and he's kind and he's compassionate. He's got all the time in the world for me to get it. So he's speaking them to, to them here and he says, listen, there are two covenants that are illustrated through the slave woman and through the free woman. And the, 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 the two covenants um, are what the issue is all about. And the one is the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant is a covenant of grace. The Sinaitic covenant is a covenant given to God, to Moses, which is law. And now we, what I want us to do is I want us to see the beauty of the new covenant. And the beauty is demonstrated in the way that God deals as a gracious father with Abraham. And when, I begin, when I've begun to unpackage and see how wonderful and how awesome it is to be in this new covenant of grace, it has just liberated my heart completely. And I trust it's going to do that for you again this morning. So I'm going to take a look at Abraham's life. And then we're going to come back and talk about the two sons. So firstly, looking at the Abrahamic covenant and how Abraham experienced it, First, we need to realize that this covenant, right, is based on justification by faith. It says in Galatians 3, verse 6 to 7, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore now know that only those who are faith of faith are sons of Abraham. So Abraham believed God. He was declared righteous. Amen. We believe in Jesus Christ through faith in his grace and are declared righteous. It's the same thing. we sons of Abraham. We believe unto righteousness. It's through faith in his grace that we are righteous. So it declares that about Abraham in the, in the, in the Abrahamic covenant. It declares that about us in the new covenant. Amen? Then it says that God blessed Abraham not based on his performance. This is absolutely amazing. Abraham did nothing. Abraham was an idol worshiper, hanging out in the Chaldeans, and I don't know what idols he was worshiping, but he was not the most righteous, glorious man, and God was, wow, look at this man. He was in a family of idol worshipers, and God calls him out, and he begins to bless Abraham, not according to his performance. 
And he says this to Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3, which is our promise as well in the new covenant. He says this, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And all the families of the earth through you will be blessed. Amen? When you go to Hebrews and you look in Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10, guess what the new covenant states? He says this, I will bless you. And I will be your father. And I have given you the new covenant. The, it was not based on his performance at all. God said, I'm going to bless you because you're my child and I love you. Amen? Now, also what I was very encouraged about Abraham's life is that Abraham was not disqualified because of his foolishness. Abraham did not get disqualified because of his foolishness. If we look at the story, God said to him, leave your family and come out. And what did he do? He decided to take Lot with him. That's blatant disobedience. So he takes Lot with him. Then he's on his journey and he comes across the Egyptians and they see, Pharaoh, uh, they see Sarah and they go, wow, this, this lady is good looking, just like my wife. And they're like, hmm, man, you know. And he, what does he go and do? He lies. And he says, no, you just tell them uh, that, you know, you're my sister and then we'll both get out of this alive. And I mean, he needed a clap against the head right there. But anyway, then this is the interesting thing. He lies to Pharaoh about his wife. Then Pharaoh gets mad and finds out the verse after when he's now getting kicked out of Egypt. It says this in Genesis 13 verse 2. It says, now Abraham left and he was very rich in livestock, in silver and gold. I'm thinking, he has this oak, disobeying, taking Lot with him, lying about his wife, and then he leaves very rich in livestock, in silver and gold. I'm not now provocating that you should go out and do foolish things and, you know, lie about your wife and disobey God. I'm not provocating that. The point of the matter is this, is that it's not based on our performance. It's not based on our performance. The blessing of God is not based on our performance in the new covenant. It is based on his great love for us and his, and his abundant grace, his unmerited favor that is poured out on our lives, that transforms our lives. And lastly, it brings us to a place of obedience because it says later on you can go and read it because it sounds confusing it says that i will bless you he does all of these things then later on it goes he takes isaac up the mountain and then uh, uh, god says because you obeyed me i will bless you so now is this obedience because of a uh, is this a blessing because of obedience or is this a blessing because god loves him no when he had gone through all of this and saw how much god loved him he obeyed with Isaac up the mountain because of love. He says, if we love him, we will obey him. So it's both. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I can just do my own thing. You know, we're under grace. This is awesome. You know, lie about my wife, take this, do that, do my own thing. No. He says, when the grace of God, the love of God, the blessing of God has so infiltrated your life, it's going to cause you to be so in love with him that you cannot help yourself but obey him even to the extreme of sacrificing your own child. Amen? So, unfortunately for him, because life happens to all of us, the pressure starts mounting. He has this promise that he is gonna be a father of many nations and the earth will be blessed through him. So he has this promise burning in his heart, which is our promise as well for every single one of us, by the way. I always say this, if your life is not yet, in, yet touching nations, you've not yet reached your potential. Amen? So he's feeling he has not reached his potential because out of his loins was to come nations and sons that would touch and change the earth. And the pressure is starting to mount because he has not yet got the son. And along comes his wonderful wife. And uh, she has an idea. And you all know what that idea is. So Sarah comes in Genesis 16. Says to Abraham, listen, I've got a great idea. Why don't you take the slave woman and have a child through her. This is now in Genesis 16, verse one to two. Now, Abraham 
he, uh, he should have thought about this thing a little bit carefully, but he just said, okay, and he, he, he got right on with it, which was not wise in the first place, okay? But anyway, what is interesting for me is that in verse four, so it says here, Sarah comes to him and says, Abraham, take Hagar. In verse four, it says here, she gets mad at him and says, why did you take Hagar? This is all a mess, it's your fault. Men? I wish Margot was here because it would be men like 50 and women like. <laughs> Tell her. I hope she's watching. It's like. Okay. So let's go back now to Galatians 4 and pick up the story now. We've set the platform here is Ishmael. We know now Ishmael was born out of the slave woman and Isaac was born from the free woman. We're gonna pick up the story again. From Galatians, we will see key characteristics of the slave woman. There are key characteristics of the slave woman. Number one, it represented a covenant of law. Number two, it says that she gives birth to bondage. She gives birth to bondage. Number three, we see that it is rooted in self-righteousness and the works of the flesh. The slave woman represents the covenant of law which gives birth to bondage, which is rooted in self-righteousness and works of the flesh. The free woman, on the other hand, represents the covenant of grace, which represents freedom and liberty, which is demonstrated through a supernatural birth a supernatural birth, something that we cannot do, that God does for us. Because the promise that you are sitting in your life is not gonna come through any other means but through supernatural birth. Amen? How many of you are sitting here today and there's certain things that God has spoken to you and you're wondering how on earth is this gonna happen? We are sons of the free woman. That means that we cannot Make it happen. We're going to have to rest in him making it happen because the promise comes through supernatural birth. Amen? So, why do we go back to operating under the law and self-righteousness? Why was it that the Galatian church found themselves drifting, drifting back? It's part of human nature, I believe. I, I realize that there's going to con continuously in my life be the struggle between self-righteousness and God's righteousness, right? There's continuously a struggle. Why? Because I am actually very impressed with myself. I'm very impressed with my skills and abilities. I'm very impressed with my education and my titles. I'm very impressed with all my abilities. I'm also love to be in control. Because when I can control myself, then I feel like I'm on top when I can control others and even to the extreme where I can begin to control God. So we begin to drift under the slave woman because not because we're intentionally evil, but because of the very deposit of the image of God in us that gives us gifts, talents, abilities, skills, education, that very thing that he's given us as a gift, we begin to focus on that, rely upon that, and get confidence and draw confidence in that, and then we begin to control our environment through the skills and the abilities that we have so that we can feel like we're on top of it. Amen? Because it's scary to let go and trust God. It's, 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 it's fearful to admit, I don't know. It's challenging to say, I'm not in control. It requires effort to push into the presence of God and spend time with Him where He gives me His plan and I don't just dump my plan on Him. Because, yeah, I can just do it because, man, I just know I've got the skills, I've got the dips, I've got the network, I've got the connections, I've got this, I'm just gonna do this. I've just... And here He says, no, no, no. You, you begin to lean and find yourself leaning towards the slave woman. When you're a child of promise, you're one that is born of a promise that is to come 
through his power and his glory. How do you know tonight there's a problem that develops from this point on? And that, this is the problem, is that we cannot have two sons living in the same house. We cannot have two sons living in the same house. I don't know about you, how many of you got families? How many of you know that one child, I won't say wife, but one child can affect the atmosphere? One child can affect the whole atmosphere of the house and disrupt the whole house. Often when I arrive home, I'll just stand outside for two minutes and listen. And if I, if I hear that it's, uh, there is one particular child that does that for us, then I go, yeah, I'm going to take another walk around the block and I'm going to come back because by then the atmosphere might have changed a little bit. But we cannot have two children living under the same house. We cannot have the child of the slave woman and the child of the free woman under one house. It's going to lead to bondage and it's going to lead to nothing happening because there's going to be confusion and division in the house. And where there's division in the house, it says a divided man will receive nothing from the Lord, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. There cannot be division in this house. Amen? So, how do you know? Let's do a litmus test. How do you know if you have the slave woman and the free woman living in your house? Now, this is going to be a bit of an anus, so just brace yourselves. It says in Galatians 4, 28, 29, And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of promise, just like Esau. But you are now being persecuted by those who want to keep you to the law. Just as Ishmael, the child born by the human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. Is there persecution in your house? That word persecution is the word Greek word which means to con continuously pursue to make fearful. To continuously pursue to make fearful. Are you experiencing in this house accusation, condemnation? If you are experiencing accusation and condemnation, which sounds like this, you did not pray long enough. This is not gonna work out for you. Who are you to say that? Why do you think this is gonna happen? Torment, continuous torment and accusation that you are not good enough or you have to strive harder or you have to work harder or you have to do that accuser of the brethren. The slave woman's child began to accuse the, the, the free woman's child. That accuser wants to derail us. He causes that through stress. God began to speak to me. He said, the moment you begin to get stressed. I want you to know, son, you've just immediately stepped into self-righteousness and you are listening to the slave woman. The moment you become anxious, you have just slept in, stepped into self-righteousness and you are listening to the accuser, which is the child of the slave woman, accusing, who are you? What are you doing? Not, you, a continuous a torment, which says the pursuit to try and harass you with fear. Insecurities, fear of man. How many of you realize that this can manifest in different ways? It can either manifest in pride or it can manifest in insecurity. It can manifest in pride, which is I'm gonna do this thing and I'm gonna show you and I, this is, I'm gonna you know, change this thing around and I'm gonna make a plan or it can manifest in insecurity. Well, you know, I don't know if, you know, I don't know really if I can do that and there's other people out there and, you know, it's just me and false humility. Manifest. The slave woman manifests in our lives in different ways and it robs us. I often, when I, because I do some career guidance and counseling with people, I realize how many people are not living in their sweet spot because they've been harassed by the accuser and I said, what would you do? What would you dream to do? I would really dream to do this. But this is what I think and this is what I feel. The accuser, you'll never be able to mount to anything. You will, do you think you could do that? What do you think? How do you? No. So many of us are trapped in a place, maybe of a wrong career or maybe of a wrong situation because 
We are listening to the slave woman's son in our lives. And th- what happens is God allows us to get to the end of ourselves. God, al- how long do I still have? Six minutes. Are you serious? Oh, my word. I'm not even, okay. Lord, help us here. Yeah. <sighs> Man, are you serious? <laughs> okay, add grace, grace. Add a couple of, I can, I'm sure Africa can, I'll pay Africa for a couple more minutes. Okay, so. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Where's Africa? You, the guys at the back there. Okay. <laughs> so. Why does it take so long to get to the end of ourselves? Why has it taken me 18 years to get to the end of myself? Why did it take Abraham 99 years? Do you know why God could only birth Isaac when he was 99? Is so that he had got to the end of himself and realized that the child was only gonna come through the promise, not through his effort, not through self-works. But when I try and do it by myself, this is how I begin to look. Who said pastoring a church is stressful? I'm 42 and feeling great. All this, the next one. In, in, 2000, in 2013, I got to the end of myself. I was absolutely finished. My wife was finished with me. Everything was finished. And I just said, God, I can't do this anymore. And he began to speak to me about my sonship. And he began to download and deposit certain things into my spirit. That began a process that began to change my life. You see, the Bible says, cast out the slave woman. We cannot cast out the slave woman. He is the one that casts out the slave woman. What we have to do is we have to renew our minds according to what he has done already for us. And that is the process. So how do we cast out the slave woman when we find these two sons and daughters living in the same house, robbing us of our purpose and destiny? How do we cast them out? Number one, we need to renew our minds. We need to renew our minds. How do we renew our minds? According to Galatians 4, the beginning that we read there, 1 to 7, we need to renew our minds with the fact that we have been redeemed from the curse of the law that Jesus Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law and I have to renew my mind that when I feel the law and when I feel the stuff and the accuser coming, I say, no, 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 I've been redeemed by Jesus Christ from this stuff. I'm not going back there. I have to renew my mind according, how does this new covenant look? It's a covenant of blessing. It's a covenant of grace. It's a covenant of not performance. I renew my mind that I'm no longer under the law because he redeemed me out of the law. And not only did he redeem me out of the law, He adopted me as his son. That word adoption is the word, the placing of a son in his rightful place. The placing of a son in his rightful place. I don't know about you, but I found myself derailed as a son because I found I had drifted. And he came and he began to turn something around in my heart and he began to renew my mind and say, no, 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 you are My son, you are in your rightful place and I love you and it's nothing that you've done because I redeemed you from the law and I chose to place you as a son and I called you my heir. That is who you are. So when the accuser comes and says you this and this and this, they say, no, no, sorry, you don't understand. You're speaking to an adopted son who's been rightfully placed, who's an heir of God, that is the promises of God that are gonna be birthed. So if you don't see the promises, that's your problem because it's gonna be supernatural birth. So don't judge me now according to what you see or don't see. Because it's irrelevant. He's going to do it because I'm his son. Amen? So how do we renew our minds? We go through the process knowing that he's redeemed us. He's redeemed us from external rules. The slave woman loves law and legalism. Do this and do that. Six steps here, six steps there. He says, no, no, no. He's redeemed us from that. He's written the laws on our hearts. And because it's been written on my heart and on my mind, I don't have to worry about a thousand rules. I don't have to, if I'm asking questions, should I drink wine? Shouldn't I drink wine? I mean, just ask the Holy Spirit. Don't go and ask your pastor. He'll say no. (laughs) And then he'll put you under law and legalism. You are a child of God. 
you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, you will expose your legalistic thinking by the questions that you ask. The moment you start asking for boundaries, can I, the students, how far can I go? Can I touch your leg, touch your arm? I don't know, just ask the Holy Spirit. But we, when we are under the law, we're looking for rules and regulations. That's why David walked into the temple and he said, hey boys, it says that we shouldn't eat this food. You're always hungry, Holy Spirit, I'm hungry. Okay guys, chow down, let's go. Why? Because he was led according to the Spirit. He, we are sons, adopted, set in place, and we are not led by rules and laws and legalisms. We are led by the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? However, just to put you at ease, the Bible also says that we are to submit ourselves under authority. So you can't go driving out here 200 kilometers an hour, jump stop streets, and then the traffic cop says to you, what are you doing? You say, yeah, I'm a son, I was led by the Spirit, and you know what? <laughs> You can't do that, amen? But we are, I love Romans 7 verse 6 says this, so now we serve not under the obedience to an old code with written regulations, but under the obedience of the promptings of the Spirit in the newness of life. Wow, how freeing and liberating to live in that place where you can just not have to have any rules and figure it all out and do it right. You say, Father, what have you got for me as your son today? You know what was amazing about the story? I, 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 I'm amazed. God never ever speaks to Abraham about Ishmael. He never speaks to, when he says to, he, when God speaks to Abraham and says, he says this, take Isaac, your only son, up the mountain. I'm thinking, hey, God, did you not realize that Abraham had two sons? What about Ishmael? You see, when you understand that your old nature, your old man has been crucified in Christ and he no longer exists, you no longer are sin consciousness of the Ishmael in your life because you, he doesn't see it. We are so aware of the Ishmaels. Ishmael, the Ishmael. I don't want you to leave. You're going, oh, I'm going to sort out Ishmael. But no, no, no. He doesn't even talk about Ishmael. He says, take your only son and go up the mountain. Then you go and read in Romans 4 and 5, and it talks about Abraham as this absolute hero of faith, and he believed God into the promise. And I said, God, you're a liar. The oak made a plan with Agar. Now you're saying he's this awesome guy. God says, no. I focus on who he is. I don't look at the Ishmaels in his life. He doesn't look at the Ishmaels in your life, rubbing them in your face and saying, what about this Ishmael? He says to you, no, you're a son of promise. You're a son of Abraham. You're Isaac, and that's who you are. Amen? Amen. The old man is dead. Don't talk about the old man. Don't refer to the old man. He's dead. <laughs> Lastly, Maybe the worship team can finish. I'll see. That. Okay, well, there's no time for the worship team. We were going to soak. You can soak at home in the presence of God. It's not going to be soaking now. Last time we get. Anyway. Let's wrap up here. I thought I had 55 minutes. It felt like two minutes. Come on, guys. Lastly, we need to be, we need to be established afresh in our position in sonship. We need to be established afresh in our sonship. God wants to set his sons in their rightful place because there is a kingdom to be advanced. And when there's division in this house and you're fighting with Ishmael's and Isaac's, you're so dear Makar, you don't even know what's happening in the house and there's confusion. And he wants us to walk as sons in their rightful place. Has the enemy tried to displace you? Has the enemy tried to displace you in the season? Who are you? You are sons and daughters of the living God. You have been set in your rightful place. You are heirs of the kingdom. You are a child of promise. You are deeply loved. You are living under his grace and his favor. And you are unique. You do not need to compete or compare yourself to everyone, anyone, because you are no longer a slave. You are a son. God is proud with, of you. And all he wants to do is enjoy deep intimacy with you, where you can call him Abba Father. Abba Father. So coming to maturity is simply this. Simply to know that you are a son of God. Coming to maturity simply means this, that as I behold him face to face, 
moment by moment, I am transformed into his image and likeness. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you for your incredible, great love for us. I thank you, Father, for setting us free, setting us in our rightful place as sons and daughters. And I want to pray, Father, today that every single son and daughter that has been displaced from their purpose and destiny, I want to pray this morning for a repositioning a replacing of sons and daughters, Father God, into their rightful place of inheritance. I thank you, Father God, that you will cast out the bond woman, the slave woman, the Ishmaels in our lives. And I pray, Father, that you declare over us a fresh sonship and inheritance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.